My last dive into the isolated life begins in Fremantle, a pleasant little port town on Australia's southwest coast. Temperatures are rising to 95 degrees today in the summer sun. And although I'm on the far end of a far-flung continent, it doesn't hold a candle to the remoteness of where I'm going. The coldest, windiest, most inhospitable land on the planet. I got a jacket in my bag. To get there, I must take a special kind of vessel. Not this one. Think about the span of human history. Millions of years as hunters and gatherers, thousands of years of civilization. The Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Delhi Sultans, the Aztecs, the Mayans, Genghis Khan's empire, the Han and the Song dynasties, Japan's Edo period with their samurais, big figures like Napoleon, Alexander the Great. None of these things mattered whatsoever where I'm going. Never heard of it. Didn't make one iota of impact. Think about the great age of exploration. Captain Cook, Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, Magellan. They never made it. Never saw it. But this guy's going. Do you know why? This is why. Raw sea, thick ice, and notorious foul weather. Conditions that would rip the ships of yesteryear to shreds. Just ask Shackleton. To pass, you need the right kind of vessel. This kind. I'm coming aboard the Maersk Perry, a 180 meter, 25,000 ton, ice class 1B chemical oil tanker. Equipped with all the provisions, emergency equipment, and a trained crew of 25 to go down through the world's most savage ocean to the world's harshest and loneliest continent, carrying with it one large package. Fuel, six million gallons of it. As I come aboard, third mate Vince Darwood runs me through the familiarization with the ship and its safety features and protocols. Life rings, life rafts, rescue boat, awesome lifeboat, infirmary, and decontamination chambers. And a look into the holy of ship holies, the bridge. Full of modern navigation's best wizardry. So this will tell you where the icebergs are. It's a radar frequency, so it's a radio frequency that hits the radar and comes back at the speed of 92,000 miles an hour. Wow, like yeah. a bat. Yeah, it's an instant reaction, but what it'll do, since it's a high definition return, uh, we'll be able to see small pieces of ice in the water. Below deck in the engine room, first engineer James Cook runs me through the heart of the vessel, including a 15,000 horsepower engine. Her fate, now my fate. Now everyone and everything aboard this ship is part of Operation Deep Freeze, a once a year refuel mission to McMurdo Station, Antarctica. As the Perry begins her journey south, the crew prepares for the worst. In his office, Captain Hatton looks over yearly ice flow charts, one of many potential hazards in the route down. What kind of swell are we in right now? Some rougher stuff. We will be all alone for this perilous crossing. To prepare, the crew runs practices and drills. Inside every room, a familiar life jacket and an unfamiliar immersion suit. In the galley, we watch training videos and practice donning the comical looking outfits. I may look like Gumby, but in the progressively colder water, this could be the difference between life or death. And the following day. Drill or real emergency. Over the loudspeaker, the scenario is called out and we hustle into action. I follow the bosun Ron quickly up the stairs. Fire imagined on the bridge, the ship's command center. 
the exterior is cooled, and we rush inside to extinguish the imagined blaze. It's been a full day on the Perry, and I settle down into my rocking cabin for a good night's rest. As we progress, the swell picks up. We are now in the Roaring Forties, so named after the rough seas and winds at this latitude. Eventually, there will be no land at all to block the vortex of water and air, which swirls unimpeded around the globe. It was these conditions that supercooled Antarctica 35 million years ago as it separated from South America. The temperature begins to drop and the nights grow shorter as we move towards the pole. I follow the crew through their routines and I speak to them about their unique lives at sea. So I started out at 13, 14 years old laughing, but the uh, boat I was working on went down and everybody got killed. No kidding. Yeah. You were the only person that survived? Yeah. Wow. Happened on my birthday, too. The bosun is the deck foreman of the ship. Ron's been working the sea for ages. And he also clues me into the deck's more curious additions. What's this uh, shelter here for? And, uh, in case there is waves, that's what this is for. If we're coming back and a wave's coming, you jump in here. This is to protect you. Keep you from getting washed overboard. Yeah. Back inside the ship's house, I meet another key player, the captain. We're on top of 6,000 tons of fuel, going through one of the harshest, if not the harshest ocean on the planet to probably the most dangerous continent on the planet. With a crew of less than 30, we're all alone here in the ocean. How much concern is weighing down on your shoulders right now? It's, it's a lot of concern. There's a lot of different departments, organizations, people that, you know, they're keeping an eye on us. But, you know, with Maersk and our constant care, I mean, we're looking forward all the time. So we're quite familiar with what, what to expect. I have all the latest uh, gadgetry, you know, to, to determine what the weather is going to be ahead, uh, ice conditions, routing. So it's, it's a lot that goes into this with, with our constant care effort. It's a mission that can't fail, so, you know, we have to keep things safe so that we can finish our mission. And I even roll up my sleeves a moment to help the first check for parity in the cylinders of the engine. I took this ride to find a story in Antarctica, but I'm discovering a similar theme aboard. People who also lead a fairly isolated life, several months at sea. Most have no old friends on board, just colleagues to socialize with over meals and coffee breaks, play a game or watch a movie. Many simply work and retire to their room. The days go by as we push from the 40 latitudes into the 50s, watching movies, reading books, exercise, and staring out into the vast blue sea. And then one morning, the lights went off. Power was back on as I arrived and the team was troubleshooting. Had I been down here without a flashlight, getting out would look like this, struggling to find my way to the outside by feel. Add heavy smoke and one wrong turn could mean death. More oceans pass, the days grow colder, and the ship has acquired new companions. Snow petrels, skua, and albatross. And then one day, something I've never seen in my life appears on the horizon. This is a tabular iceberg, an Antarctic specialty. The traditional cathedral-like iceberg you see is capped off of a glacier while this has snapped off of the ice shelf. The watch on the bridge doubles. The crew carefully eyes the radar and the horizon. Soon, the ship itself is completely surrounded. You can tell by the pure white color that most of this is what they call first year ice, which the ship can safely push out of the way at slow speed. But the crew is up there in the bridge looking for any dark blue ice, 
which has been around many seasons and over the course of time it's pushed all the oxygen and salt out of it becoming tough as nails. If the ship hits that at any good speed it could rip us open like a buck knife through an aluminum can. But this, this is beautiful. Wow. As our ship pushes into the McMurdo Sound, we're joined by the U.S. Coast Guard's Polar Star Icebreaker, which leads us through a narrow channel. And a new set of companions accompany us. Pods of killer whales, seals, and solitary penguins out for a stroll. Or a skedaddle. After two weeks at sea, the Maersk Perry pulls into port. Thin lines are blasted over to shore, attached to bigger ones, and then in a complex layout, we moor the ship to harbor. The rugged vessel and crew have carried me safely across the planet's most treacherous sea. And in a minute, I'm going to put my feet on the world's most elusive continent and explore America's media-shy McMurdo base. Despite the inherent unsustainability, America has established the continent's largest community. It's not a quaint small town. In McMurdo, the air often rumbles with the sound of heavy machinery or the staccato chop of helicopter blades. It looks like a Mad Max style compound from the front and a scrapyard from the back. Many of the buildings are college-like dorms, but inside most structures, something novel awaits. While I'm in McMurdo, I'll get walloped with the continent's capricious weather, snowing one day, blasting 55 knots the next. I first pay my respects at the National Science Foundation's chalet, and then begin to poke around the town under their watchful eyes. McMurdo is notoriously edgy about their public image. Employees must behave off the clock. Media is carefully vetted, but somehow nobody knows exactly why I'm here. I may have slipped through administrative oversights, some loophole. I must get the skinny discreetly, not endangering anyone's job or getting myself banished. I begin my exploration in building 155, the hub of the base. Here you can chow 24 hours a day, get your hair did, or throw the resident DJ a request. Maybe something from their unbelievable vinyl collection dating back to the 50s. From the get-go, everyone is sunshine and rainbows about McMurdo. So three seasons, what keeps you coming back? The people. <laughs> and it, um, it's a good way to save money, too. It sounds like it's mainly about community. It is, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, nice. Cool. Look at Dapper. Yep. <laughs> More handsome than Justin Bieber? Always. Yeah? Yeah, totally. Oh, that made my day. <laughs> I load up on some grub and prepare for a scramble around town. This time of the year, I can explore until I collapse. The sun will never set. All this food and everything the base needs comes in just once a year. And when that ship leaves, it takes all the garbage. Every single bit goes back to the United States, including 700 boxes of food waste that look just like this. I've walked into McMurdo's Waste Barn, where Oscar the Grouch, the patron saint of garbage, presides over the base's super efficient program. 14th year in a row being the supervisor of 14 years and you've got what, 17, 16 in total in Antarctica? Yep. What keeps bringing you back? Uh, the people, uh, the environment, travel, getting out of my cubicle for four and a half months a year, you know, things like that. With over 60% of waste recycled, every resident must do their part. All over the base, there are spectrums of bins. 
But the most effective recycling is a rather old school concept gone viral. This is Skua Central in McMurdo. Skua is a scavenging, aggressive seabird, but it's also is synonymous here with uh, free box, hand-me-down stuff. I've become infected by this Skua thing. I can't get enough. I mean, who knows what you could find? You know, we could do like a new show, a Storage Wars kind of thing, but with Skua boxes. Like how much money would you bid for this? Everything aside. $20, $20, everything aside. The stuff I'd really like to Skua, I can't. These piston bullies, those deltas, or ooh, ooh, Ivan the Terabus. Inside the heavy vehicle facility, big new cats are replacing case quad tracks for traverse duties, schlepping fuel and supplies to America's South Pole Station 850 miles away. Now hold up. I've already met a heap of folks, but you may have noticed I haven't met a scientist. This is not an aberration. Over 80% of McMurdo's employees are subcontracted. The Antarctic program's primary contractor? Defense firm Lockheed Martin. One way to solidify a land claim is to bear children. Argentina did that. Another way? Establish a post office. This is Colonel Dahl of the U.S. Air Force addressing the Perry crew. What we really are is that last bit of global reach that America has to go around the world and pull to pull. But whatever the end game, the Antarctic Treaty is currently holding firm, banning commercial exploration and reserving the continent for a feast of science. America's contribution to research is headquartered here in the Crary Center, where breakthrough studies are evidenced in the displays. Now here's a nifty feature of McMurdo. You can walk out of the Science Center and be in a bar in 60 seconds. From there, you can take a short stroll and taste the golden age of Antarctic exploration, as if it happened yesterday. Beside the dock is Captain Scott's Discovery Hut. Shackleton was here as a team member on Scott's first failed attempt at the pole in 1902. Shackleton's men were here over a decade later, eating seal meat and praying for rescue. Can you imagine being hunkered down in just this section of the cabin for four months? You definitely discover something about yourself and your buddies. On the other side of town, a volcanic cylinder cone called Ob Hill beckons those looking for a grand vista. On top, another reminder from the harsh continent. This cross was erected a year after explorer Captain Scott lost his life coming back from the South Pole. Poor guy, one of the worst runs of luck ever. He thought he'd be the first person to set his feet there. But when he arrives, there's another hut right on the spot. A different explorer, Abmanson, beat him to it by a month. And inside a note, Dear Captain Scott, thought you'd be the next guy to come here, so feel free to use anything you want. And by the way, could you deliver this letter to the royalty of Norway? Let him know I made it. Thus they say, Captain Scott went an explorer and he came back a postman. But he actually never came back. He got caught in a blizzard and starved to death just 11 miles from a food and fuel depot. His body's still out there in the ice, perfectly preserved, slowly making its way to the sea. And one day, who knows, maybe a little chunk of ice will break off and that berg will float out. Captain Scott's last voyage.
My time in Scott has ended, and my time in McMurdo is coming to a close as well. All the fuel is off the ship. When the wind abates, we sail. McMurdo may not be easy on the eyes, but just beyond it, the true nature of the continent is revealed in every direction. Here, the white expanse into the great wide open begins. <laughs>